Hello students and welcome to our first series of Unit 4, Community Ecology. Please go through as many times as you can and then we can discuss um, whatever you don't understand in class. So what comes to mind when you hear of the word community? You are probably familiar with the term when it comes to humans and the communities, words such as neighborhoods, towns and cities that we live in. The definition of community that we use in ecology is similar. In ecology, a community is a group of two or more populations of species living and interacting with each other in the same geological space or same location. Remember that we say a population is um, organisms or individuals living together, belonging to one species. So a community is made up of various <clears throat> populations. So a community can consist of plants, animals, bacteria, viruses, and all forms of living organisms that occupy the environment. Community ecologists are scientists that study communities. <clears throat> there are a lot of complex interactions for these scientists to study and discover how communities function on Earth. So community ecologists examine how communities are structured, and we are going to learn some of these things, uh, some of these things, what species live within our communities, what is their biodiversity like, um, the interaction of species within these communities, um, etc. So a community can range from being very small, like an association of microorganisms in the mammalian gut, uh, to huge communities such as grasslands, etc. So community ecology is a branch of ecology that looks at how organism interacts with each other and look at the community structure such as species richness, diversity, uh, abundance, etc. So it deals with patterns and processes involving two or more species, two or more populations. Communities are defined, again, as a group of interacting not just one species, but different species occupying the same geogra geographical location. Populations rarely, if ever, live in isolation from populations of other species. Uh, for example, let's look at humans. We do not live in isolation to animals and plants, and we live together. And this is especially true for villagers or natural environments. I know that nowadays we have also excluded nature in our built environments, but um, humans do not live in isolation with other uh, organisms. <clears throat> so a community is living organisms bound together by the interactions and relationships between different species. Um, we can better understand communities by examining how species interact with one another and the results of these interactions. So changes, for example, within one species can result in a cascading effects and other species within a community. Um, so we can describe and define interactions based on positive or neutral or negative effects that the interactions have on these species. <clears throat> And, so, and this is some of the things that we're going to discuss. So these are some of the interactions that happen. We have competition, where it's a, a, a negative, negative. The interaction uh, can be detrimental to both species. None of the species really benefits. We discuss more in details. We have predation, which is a positive minus herbivory, uh, uh, positive minus parasitism, positive minus. So, these interactions are beneficial to only one species and detrimental to the other. <clears throat> then we have mutualism, which is a, a plus plus. So it's a positive interaction that benefits both species. And then we have commonalism, um, commensalism, um, where one species benefits, but the other one is unharmed or unaffected. Let's look at competition. 
Competition is, um, is a relationship um, between individuals of two species in which both species are harmed as they attempt to utilize the same resources. Uh, these resources, oftentimes, they are in limited supply. For example, um, grass that, that is growing on a steep mountainside, eaten by both the mountain goats and <clears throat> and the ship. Competition can be direct or indirect. An example of direct competition would be two different species of birds. Um, for example, a kingfisher and a heron, and both these birds are predators competing for fish, which is a prey, a leaf in a lake. And then we can also have an indirect competition, uh, for example, between two big cats that hunt for the same prey animal but they, they hunt at different times of the day. For example, the leopards are big, are big cats that hunt for, for a deer at night. And then you have the cheetah, who's a big cat that hunt for a deer during the day. They're competing for the same resource, though they hunt at different time. Competition occurs also between all species, including microorganisms, parasites, insects, plants, and animals. Different species of plants compete for temperature, light, humidity, and space to grow and reproduce. Animal species compete for things like water, food, shelter, territory, mates, etc. So when it comes to competition, usually the less fit individual will lose in terms of survival and reproduction. But either way, both species will be harmed in some way because they have to use a lot of energy to compete for these resources. So like I said, um, competition um, is a, a negative, negative interaction when species compete for resource in a very short time. Um, we are going to talk a little bit um, about interspecific and intraspecific competition. Where you have strong competition, uh, it can lead to competitive, competitive exclusion, and meaning that a species can be eliminated locally by its competitor. So Gold's competitive exclusion principle states that two species competing for the same limiting resource cannot coexist in the same place, one will eventually be eliminated. And we discuss a bit further as we go on um, on what competitive exclusion principle is. The competitive exclusion principle states that two species cannot or they are unable to coexist within the same exact ecological niche. We are going to discuss how, uh, from here on, we're going to discuss what a niche and what a ecological niche is. So basically they cannot coexist in the same place if they're competing on the same resource. So different species may not coexist within a community if they are competing for the same resources. It's important to understand that competition is bad in terms of survival and reproduction for both species or for both competitors. Even though one species will eventually become victorious or one is eliminated, for example, both species have spent a lot of energy and a great deal of effort and force and energy fighting for the limited resource or fighting for the territory. And this principle holds true because if, if there is competition between two species, for example, uh, for a shared resource, maybe we have an example of a parrot and a token, and they are sharing the same resource, which is the fig tree within a community, then natural selection, we select for traits that lessen the species reliance on shared resource. Eventually, these species are forced to, to adapt um, to to this um, to the conditions that are enforced on them. 
So if the species with a less than desirable trait is unable to, to adopt, then it will um, it will be eliminated. Ultimately, it will be driven to extinction locally, or it will be forced to find a new community that it can occupy. So it can maybe migrate somewhere else, or if it will definitely be eliminated by its competitor. So in the images that are shown here show an experimental study with two uh, protozoan species. We have Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum. The protozoa were grown individually in a laboratory in graph A, so in graph A and B, the protozoa are grown individually um, or separately from one another. And you can see that they, in both cases, they are thriving and increasing in population size. However, when they <laughs> were grown together, when the two species are mixed together and placed in the same beaker, two to grow together, one is out competed and it leads to the uh, P. caudatum going extinct in the beaker, while the uh, P. aurelia population increases and thrives. So this is an example of competitive exclusion principle. Um, they're competing for these same resources in the beaker, so one is eliminated um, or outcompeted by the other. Let's stop on resource partitioning. So contrary to competition, some neighbors within a community find ways to practice resource partitioning. Resource partitioning really is a strategy in which different species use different parts or aspects of a resource that is limited rather than try to compete directly for the same resources. So you, maybe you have a, a tree um, that is fed feeding many or two different organisms, but the two species are using um, different parts of the tree to avoid competition. So this is resource partitioning. So you're dividing the same resource by using it differently. So to partition for resources, communities allocate resources to reduce competition. And in doing so, most species are able to coexist with one another within the same ecosystem. And this then increases the ability of the entire community to capture en energy and matter, um, thus benefiting all the species living within that community. Um, we are going to discuss a known example uh, as shown here. I think we'll discuss it in the next slides as well. So a known, a known example of this are the uh, unknown results. Um, they are found in Puerto Rico. And um, this is uh, showing some of the pictures of the, of the lizards. This group of lizards contains many different species that inhabit the similar niche of the trees and communities. But for each species to survive on the limited amount of food and energy available, they must make use of different resources within the community. So within the same tree, they, ex um, they ex occupy different uh, locations and they um, they feed on different parts of the trees. So natural selection has produced different species that excel in different niches, with each species having its own preferred habitat, though it's within the same um, ecosystem. This unique habitat it is defined by different vegetation, such as the trees and shrubs within the same community. For example, some release out are <laughs> preferring the shrubs, some are uh, on the upper part of the tree, some are in the trunk, um, etc. The same resource that is used differently by the different species. So this unique habitat is defined by different vegetation, the different amounts of sunlight, different amounts of moisture levels and other biotic and biotic factors. And based on these factors, each lizard species consume slightly different food, food sources from the same resource. And that occupies different niches within the ecosystem. Again, I'm going to discuss what a niche is 
um, and not so long from now. In doing so, the lizard species avoid competition with one another. So this is what we call resource partitioning. This increases the biodiversity of the ecosystem by increasing the survival and growth of his species within the, the ecosystem. For example, another example that I can think of is, for example, spinach. Um, say, for example, they're, um, you're competing, uh, two species are competing for same spinach, but one, they, they just eat the roots of the spinach and not the other eats the leaves. So they are not competing in such a way, though they're using the same resource, um, they are focusing on different parts of the same resource. So this is resource partitioning. So let's look, let's look at, at niche, what a niche is. Um, some people pronounce it as niche and some pronounce it as a niche. An ecological niche is the sum of the habitat requirements that allows a species to persist and produce offspring in in the ecosystem or the role it plays in the ecosystem or how it uses the resources in the in the ecosystem. And when we're talking about resource partitioning, you know, each each species occupying its own habitat, it's really a niche. So it's the place it occupies and how it uses the resources in the ecosystem. And each species has its own niche or its own role. It, it plays in the ecosystem. Uh, so it's basically the precise way of how it fits into an ecosystem. Um, so a niche describes how an organism or population responds to the distribution of resources and competitors and how that organism modifies those, those factors. Let's discuss a, a little bit more. Like I said, every species within a community occupies its own unique place called a niche. A niche, therefore, is the position that an individual species occupies, or it's the role it plays within that community. And this includes how that species gets its energy and nutrients, how it survives, how it reproduces, what its habitat is composed of, etc. A niche also includes how an organism interacts with other living species, and we call these biotic components, and how it interacts with the surrounding or the abati components, things like water, air, minerals, sunlight, etc. For example, on this slide, we can see a shark, right? And this is a fish that is a top predator in, in, in the food chain. The niche that this shark occupies is going to be very different than another fish species that, it, that lives within the same community. So the shark is the predator and the smaller fish are its prey. The shark consumes a wide variety of fish species to obtain energy to survive and reproduce. This shark and the fish it eats will occupy different parts of the same ecosystem, of the same community or environment but they will focus on different habitats. So this shark and the fish, it's, it, it, it or its prey will occupy different parts of their water column as a survival strategy. And so therefore they're able to coexist. For example, maybe the shark lives most of the time near the water surface looking for prey. Where is the prey find, um, spend most of their lives hiding at depth to avoid their shock. So they, they occupy, each one has its own unique environment or habitat that they occupy and the food that it eats and how it interacts with the water and how it interacts, it interacts with other organisms. So in short, that is the niche, the role, the unique role or the position an organism occupies and the role it plays within its community, how it survives, how it uses the un energy and the nutrients, all this, all the requirements of that particular uh, organism. So you can really describe a niche in different ways. And hopefully, if you don't understand, we can discuss it later on. We have what we call a fundamental niche and a realized niche. A fundamental niche is a niche potentially occupied by the species 
So potentially what it can occupy and the realized niche <clears throat> is the niche that it actually occupies in the environment. And many times these are different, but sometimes a realized niche can also be the fundamental niche. Let's look at the examples be, um, on these slides. So here, um, we are looking at an experiment carried by um, Joseph Cornell, an ecologist who studied two pinnacle species, Balanus planoides and Thamalis telatus, uh, that have a stratified distribution of rocks along the coast of Scotland. In nature, Balanus fails to survive high on the rocks because it's, it's unable to resist desiccation or drying out, so it occupies the low tides. As you can see here, so the balanus um, occupies the low tide, that is, it's realized. It's, so its realized niche is therefore similar to its fundamental niche. So even if you were to remove this uh, Santhamalis um, species, um, it would not occupy this area because it does not like to dry out. It's unable to resist uh, desiccation. So in this case, they realized that the fun a fundamental niche for the um, balanus is the same. But this scientist wanted to study the fundamental niche for the Synthamalus species. So what he did is he removed the balanus from the lower strata. And when he removed the balanus from the lower strata, he realized that the Synthamalus population spread on that area as well. So potentially it can also live there, but because of competition um, or competitive exclusion, it's usually it's excluded to live in that area. But when balanus is not present, it spreads in that area. So the spread of Synthamalus when balanus was removed indicates that competitive exclusion makes the realized niche of Synthamalus much smaller than its fundamental niche. So in this case, its fundamental niche is much bigger. It's able to occupy the lower strata, but because of a competition, it focuses more on the high tide, which is its realized niche. So its realized niche, it's where it's really occupying, but fundamentally, or potentially it can occupy a bigger area if competition was not there. So that's the difference between a fundamental and a realized niche. Again, we spoke of uh, resource partitioning where there is a division of environmental resources by a coexisting species. Resource partitioning allows the two different species occupying the same environment to coexist. So the niche of each species differ by one or more significant factors from the niches of co all coexisting species. Again, we spoke of the lizards as an example, occupying the same environment. Some, are, um, some lizards occupy the trunk and they eat the, whatever they find there, and some are found on the upper part of the trees, and some on the shrub layers, etc. The next type of uh, community interaction that we're going to discuss is predation. Predation in basic terms is the relationship between individuals of two species in which one organism, the predator, kills and consumes the other species, which is the prey. And there are many variations of predation and species that play predator and prey. We are uh, traditionally we look of we think of predation of predators like looking at big carnivores such as lions as being predators and consuming smaller animals as their prey. However, we can also recognize herbivory as a form of or type of, of, of predation, which is the consumption of plants by animals through grazing or browsing. And then there are other interfaces of predation, scavenging, like I said, herbivory as well, and um, minor predations, um, parasites, etc. We'll talk about this when we start talking about um, parasitism. 
both predators and prey have evolved ways to survive. Predators have evolved or have become better hunters and prey species have evolved or adopted better mechanisms for defenses. And predation defense mechanisms can take many forms such as mechanical, chemical, physical, and behavioral. And we can um, discuss some of this in the next slides. Mechanical defenses, um, so these are called, also called anti-predator defenses, and we can uh, discuss some of these. Um, so mechanical defenses are things like tree with thorns, and the hard exterior shells of turtles or the quills of the porcupines, etc. The chemical defenses are released by the prey species when threatened um, to prevent attacks by the, by the predators. And the chemical molecules are toxins um, or repellents that are released from the spines or the teeth or the glands and the pores in the skin in order to poison or to ward off the, the predators. So there are many uh, different um, mechanisms that prey or predators use as, as defenses or better ways for the predators to catch their prey. And then um, we have animal behaviors such as, you know, fleeing or hiding or self-defense or making noise to ward off the predators. And sometimes hiding could include camouflage. <laughs> um, for example, in this picture, we have cryptic coloration where they camouflage with the environment so they're not um, identified the, the, by their predators. And uh, like I said, mechanical defenses include things like thorns and spines, um, et cetera. So species can also use their physical appearance to avoid predators. Gray species can use colorations and patterns to avoid predators. For example, the use of camouflage, like we discussed just now, to avoid the detection. Other species like the zebra, for example, they cluster together to use their um, their striped patterns to confuse the predators like the lions to make it challenging to determine where one animal ends and where the other one begins. And so these are some of the strategies they use. Um, some species mimic or copy another species um, coloration. So if you look at them, two butterflies here. Um, so two butterflies shown here, one is monarch. That is quite poisonous, but the other is called the visceral. These are not. Uh, these are not poisonous, but the visceral do not have the same toxic chemical. The visceral mimic monarchs by having very similar coloration and weight patterns, and so the predators know monarchs are poisonous and assume that the visceral are also poisonous, so they avoid the visceral, so they use this mechanism that mimic another organism. And so many insect species use mimicry to trick predators not to be eaten by them. Um, there are different types of mimicry, um, the partition mimicry where, uh, like we said, a palatable harmless species mimic uh, a harmful one to avoid predation and a mutual mimicry where both species uh, benefit uh, by um, using the same, having the same um, appearance. And this is called the Mullerian uh, mimicry. And let's look at symbiosis, which is a relationship where two or more species live in direct and intimate contact with one another. This could be beneficial or not. Um, we look at parasitism and mutualism. Let's start with parasitism, which is um, also a form of predation, really. Um, we'll discuss this later. So this is a, a, a negative uh, plus interaction. One organism derives nourishment from its host, which is harmed in the process. And for example, we have endoparasites and ectoparasites. Some live, their parasite, their endoparasites lives inside the host and ectoparasites lives on its uh, surface. And we have a situation where eventually the host is killed, which is parasitoidism. And this is nasty. We, in humans, 
uh, for example, there are pathogens that cause different diseases um, and these are very nasty. And they cause organisms that can be considered and this can also be considered as predators, as, as I said. Then we have mutualism, which is um, plus-plus interaction. So there's benefits both species. So this is an interaction um, that benefits both species. For example, the nitro nitrogen fixation of bacteria in the root nodules of legumes, um, digestions of cellulose by microorganisms in the digestive system of termites. Even we have some beneficial bacteria that lives in, in inside us in our guts that helps with digestion. And in the process, you know, they are fed while they are there, obviously they are thriving in our guts and uh, they help us with digestion, etc. Then we have the absorption of phosphates, nitrates and potassium aided by mycorrhizae and etc. Um, another example of mutualism is where you have you found it in acacia trees where you have um, that have hollow thorns that house uh, stinging ants. So the ants feed on the nectar from the tree and on the protein rich excretions from the tree. And then the ants attack anything that touches the tree, removing the finger spores, small herbivores and other vegetation growing close to the trees. And then we have an example of communalism, another interaction called commensalism, which is um, a positive negative. This interaction is very rare. So one species benefits, but the other one is not really affected. And like I said, these interactions are very hard to, to find in nature. Um, and any close association, association likely affects both species um, in most cases. Uh, many interactions affects both species, but here you have an interaction that one species benefits, but the other one is, is unharmed or unaffected. The simplest example of common solisum is a bird making a nest in a tree. The tree provides shelter and protection to the bird without getting significantly harmed or affected by the bird. So um, this ends our first series on uh, community ecology. Um, next, we'll talk about the community structure and dynamics. So uh, please go through this series over and over again and identify the things you don't understand so we can discuss them in class.